Good Monday morning. It's, oh, really sunny. This video is the second ever developer discussion video, which is a format that I'm trying out, an interview format for Fun Fun Function. I'm putting all of them in a playlist up here or here. Today, we're having a developer discussion with Tierney Siren. Tierney is a co-chair of the Node.js Community Committee, which is a top-level committee in the Node.js Foundation. So if you want to talk about Node.js and building communities in general and writing documentation and tutorials for Node, Tierney is the person to talk to. Tierney talks to me about having a mindset of helping other developers grow. And this is an attitude that I really admire and that uh, hits close to home. In, in software development, uh, there is an, an upper limit to how much code that uh, one brain and, and two hands can write. And that means that the most valuable type of developer is one that spends a lot of their uh, time focused outwards, helping uh, the developers around them to be the best developers that they can possibly be. So uh, Tierney and me talk about uh, why he loves documentation so much, um, the value of batching communication. We also talk about how to delegate in open source projects. And uh, he, uh, he also tells a great story about uh, IOJS and how to be a leader of big changes in a big software development uh, community. Before we get on with the interview, I would like to thank today's sponsor, LaunchDarkly. As you might know, LaunchDarkly is a product and company that helps you manage feature flags. Now, if you've worked with feature flags and feature rollout, you probably know this feeling when you're rolling a feature out and the information about the feature or rollout is in like five different places, like an Excel spreadsheet there and like uh, some chat there. So what if there was a single place where developers have more visibility and more control over their features? So LaunchDarkly and Atlassian have teamed up so that you can see your features that are related to your stories and issues in Jira. So you can read up on how to combine Jira with LaunchDarkly at launchdarkly.funfunfunction.com. That link is also in the episode description. I am MPJ. This is Fun Fun Function, and you are watching a developer discussion with Tyrone Sarn. I can't watch movies anymore without analyzing them uh. Uh, because that was like two of my courses was like how to detect different things and like building that stuff. And I miss practicing that. Like I miss going in and building it rather than just watching other people's stuff. So that's like the, the editing part is the part I miss yeah. a lot. It was a lot of fun. Editing is a lot of fun. Like, uh... It's time consuming. Uh, and it's very, un like, especially when you do something new, it's incredibly yep. unpredictable. Normally I spend like six hours editing every ep episode, yep. uh, but now with the new format where we can like just play along yep. more and like just, uh, like, oh, let's just build something. Yeah. Oh my God. Like it took 26 hours. <laughs> uh, so I didn't wow. sleep be between yep. Sunday and Monday and just completely just threw me yep. whack. Uh, I'm starting to repair myself now. For your information, we're recording. Oh, sweet. Can you please just double check that we're recording audio as well? Yes. I ended up getting into development and developer advocacy via um, contributing to open source. Oh. So when IOJS forked out from Node, I actually started contributing to the website because Michael Rogers, um, who's a mentor of mine, uh, reached out and said to a bunch of people and said, hey, we're looking for non-code contributions. Um, and those are really important because those are some of the hardest things yes. to get. So uh, that's how I jumped in. Uh, the, fir the first contribution I made actually uh, got rejected because I, uh, I was fixing a problem that wasn't a problem. I was changing markdown links uh, for, to direct links. So okay. like hard, hard coding the yeah. URLs, which wouldn't work locally. If Oh. Yeah, so it was uh, it was a little bit rough on the that side, but it, that it actually encouraged me to continue contributing. Like writing documentation yep. and uh, being focused on a community, yep. that is, I would say, like a non-obvious yep. route for a developer. That is, it, it kind of 
it's very valuable. It's sort of like how, how my background in theater can be used for something, but, but it's also a little bit weird. Yep. Like, how did that come to be? So I've considered myself a technical writer for a long time and I'm good at writing. And that was a, a gap that I recognized over you know, multiple projects that there's always a gap of technical writers and people who can come and write documentation. Because I'm interested in open source and interested in code, it's a good way for me to kind of bridge that gap and help these projects that are you know, inherently open source uh, grow both their communities and also grow my value to those communities. So why like you say that you consider yourself a technical writer? Like writing to me, like it's a skill that takes a lot of time to develop. Like being able to write code does not uh, yep. mean that you're good at uh, writing text and communicating and building like something of a uh, of a narrative or a pedagogical approach. Yep. Where did you learn that? So uh, you know, part of my college education was around uh, communication information design. Um, and so I had to do it kind of a lot through that. So I actually took a few technical writing courses, but those weren't even necessarily part of the core curriculum. Um, it was more just out of interest. But the way that I kind of have developed that skill over time has very much been just engaging with other people and actually having them review my writing and then uh, give me feedback on it. Uh, some of the most uh, disheartening feedback has often been the most constructive. Yeah. What is the thing about about it that you like why, why is it why is something like this rewarding to you documentation gets very low on the yep. priority list yep. of a lot of software project even though it's so extremely appreciated when yep. it works well when you dive into a project and there is there is documentation that just pulls you in and yep. it's just easy to work with and there's a getting started guy perhaps a little book that is so appreciated yet it's so uncommon so I, I think the, the reason that I love doing it so much is because exactly what you said. It's inherently helpful to developers and th I've kind of found that that's what I care about. I care about helping other developers and helping them grow. Oh. So I care about tools that are for developers. I care about things that are for developers. And so that's kind of where my skill set, ex my existing skill set and uh, my passion kind of collides. And so that's why it's a, it's a, it's a good place for me. So uh, I like, want to switch gears a little bit and like jump back to uh, work days and like, uh, and working as a software developer or, or working in general in mm -hmm. software. Um, what is a, uh, habit or a skill that you cultivated in the last few years, um, something that you started doing that you didn't do before, yep. that ha that you th think has been very valuable to yep. you as a developer and like yeah. So again, um, I, I think this largely comes down to communication. Uh -huh. um, one of the the things that I found about myself early on when I was kind of working in software and working uh, on open source projects was that. I would have the time to write a, a huge epic of like, you know, what I thought or, you know, why the reason we needed this. Mm -hmm. Over time that had kind of gotten um, a little bit slimmer. And so I'd been communicating a, a bit shorter form and kind of trickling my ideas in yeah. rather than directly communicating them um, in like a blast. And oh. so that kind of enables me to, um, I, I had to step back and, and kind of go back to the previous approach of, uh, sharing a large amount of information at once. Yeah. And that has really actually helped me push my own goals forward um, and help me enable the rest of my team to actually uh, be a little bit more effective and uh, work together a bit more effectively. So I'm not sure if I understand. You're talking about like batching the communi uh, communication in, in chunks and like allowing it to build up a little bit more instead of like writing a Slack message here and a Slack message. Then. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's uh, I, I ended up doing that, like just a, like kind of trickling my ideas in over time rather than kind of uh, building them into a cohesive unit and kind of sharing them at once um, to, to tell the full story there. And so uh, that's you know what I'm, I'm doing now. And I yeah. found it to be a lot more effective in terms of actually being able to push goals and, and communicate more effectively with other people. Uh, it's interesting that you talk about uh, how you read into another person's uh, communication style. Um, 
because I've, uh, I've, I've thought a lot about this uh, recently where about how to communicate effectively. And in order to do that, uh, you need to spend a lot of time listening first. Um, what you talk about is listening to communication style, but there's also one thing that I feel is also important, like figuring out the context that that person lives in. Uh, we had one guy at Spotify who was amazing at this. He, he had, he was in charge of these infrastructure projects that he needed to promote inside the organization. Like we have built this new tool, it's really great and stuff. We're building it. Uh, but whenever he arrived at the office, he didn't really talk about it. Like he spent like two days in the office, like just talking to people, talking about, checking out what their needs were and like, mm, what are you doing? Uh, and then, and only then, he started talking about it. Like sometimes he didn't talk about it at all because he just felt like, ah, I think we need to make a few tweaks to this yep. uh, before we talk to these people. Yep. Or sometimes he just started talking, but he always did it like with a full understanding of our context. Yep. And I felt that that was uh, very powerful. Is this something that you have uh, worked with as well? Or is it something that you recognize yourself in? Yeah, so I, I think that uh, definitely, I can. While you're kind of talking through that, I can see a lot of instances instances of that in the the Node project. Even um, like when we had a discussion around changing build tools, which is a massive undertaking. Feeling like you're being heard and being listened to mm -hmm. actually helps build consensus, and yes. it helps build um, empathy toward whatever the person is going to suggest. Just the feeling of like, yes, I'm being listened to they have heard me like even if your needs are being ignored at least they you know that they okay they they understand them and they have prioritized my needs and it seemed like perhaps it was only me that had yep. this problem then i'm fine at least they they prioritize correct yeah 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 and uh, e even in that context like that that is such a drain on time to actually go through and do that for everyone who's a stakeholder, everyone who is involved, like even if they're not a stakeholder, you have to go and build that consensus and go and build that relationship out with people as much as possible. Um, it takes a lot of time. And that's honestly in, in the, the Node.js community committee, that's where a lot of our work goes, um, is doing that kind of work of going and building consensus, going and building relationships, going and uh, understanding people so we can help them help themselves. If you, like when you interact with other open source maintainers, people like that start out open source projects. Uh, from your standpoint, as like from what you've learned as uh, uh, like managing a, a community for so long, what are uh, some common misconceptions that you feel are, are uh, like repeats themselves yeah. in open source maintainers, like their expectations about what it's like to have a community around your your project yeah. and uh that it's going to be easy <laughs> and that the, the first uh stab at something is going to be the hardest one mm. the the hard part of open source isn't launching something or isn't doing something initially it's actually maintaining maintaining it over the long haul mm. um it's a understanding that you're making a commitment longer than this initial investment. Um, and that's something I pretty consistently see people tripping up over is there's a project that gets a lot of attention. It's a good project, like a genuinely good tool. Yeah. Um, but when the maintainers are going into this for the first time, they haven't been involved in other open source projects and they don't really have anyone to talk to about that yeah. or what to expect around it. Um, they get caught up in, oh, now I have this massive thing with a ton of attention that I have to maintain. Yeah. And the, the, the hardest thing is kind of detaching yourself and leveling up other people. Uh. So once you launch initially, then you need to kind of step back a bit and make sure you're leveling up other people who are expressing the most interest. Otherwise, you're stuck in this constantly constant torrent of ever increasing work and yep. you are the only one that knows things you become yep. ever more important yep. even if you get deputies they are not autonomous enough so they are going to like divert questions to yep. you and you're going to feel even more pressure yep. even though you have more deputies yeah it's it becomes a burden real quick and it's a good way to burn out of tech, tech. like it's a really good way to do that real fast
Um, and so, you know, one of the ways you can avoid that is give people a, a domain, give people a space that they can own oh. and give them the decision making power, enable them to go make that decision um, when it comes to it and let them um, be the owner of op this piece of your open source project. What is important? Uh, what, are, or, what are important things to think about when when you want to give someone the ownership of a domain. How do you instill that sense of ownership? Yep. Uh, especially in the cases where perhaps this is a remote working situation, perhaps you, perhaps you never met this person. Yep. I, I think the important thing is to make sure that they know they're supported. Um, and that comes in a variety of formats. Um, one, you, have to, you do have to make yourself available to them. You have to make sure that they ha know they can talk to you if they need to, if they're concerned about something, or if there is, um, a problem that they don't know how to solve, they can come to you. That said, they are still the ones that have the final decision-making power. So why is that important? Because that seems counterintuitive to me. Uh, like in order to instill a sense of ownership, I, like, I, I kind of want to, like, yep. my intuition is to yep. like, just dump it on them so that they feel like, oh shit, if I don't <laughs> do this, it's gonna like fall down like a house of cards. Yeah, so the, the reason that's important is because um, it helps them make them. It helps them feel a sense of community in this project, and and I, I do get where you're coming from with that, where uh, it they're still kind of a deputy. Mm. But the 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 thing that I've encountered most often, and I you know as chair of the community committee, I had to do this a lot, um, is I encountered people n n having the power, but still not feeling like they were enabled to go use it. And so they need to they need to be reassured that they have that power. Uh -huh. So it's not even giving them context, it's saying, yes, this is yours, because they need to hear that multiple times. Mm. Uh, dumping something on people, and this happened a few times in the community committee, um, if you don't give them attention and kind of help them level up to a point where they can help level other people up into maintaining it, um, they end up dropping out. Uh, that happened. Several times, unfortunately. Um, and so if you get uh, multiple people, so not just a single person, but actually end up getting a group, I found about three people is generally useful, like a, a good group size where you can totally drop out. Huh. Um, but getting a few people who are interested in this specific domain, this specific space, um, and let them kind of start pinging off each other so they have their own support network that may, owns this, um, that's a good place where you can be like, okay, I'm hands off. This is yours now. Um, you still need to be there for them when they're, you know, if they're totally new to this project, they, they're not uh, familiar with how your governance works or even what your own ideals are. You mentioned uh, IOJS. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people that have gone into development ha uh, recently have no idea about that yep. story. I think that you should, can you tell the story oh, yeah. about IOJS and what, what yes, and uh, what led up to it and I, I feel like it's a juicy one. Yeah, so um, Node.js was originally uh, a project under a single company. Um, that company was, the original goal of IOJS at 0 0.1, or sorry, the original goal of Node.js at 0 0.1 was to be feature complete at 1.0. There was going to be no additional features. It was perfect. Mm. Realistically, that never really happens. Um, yeah, that was a very weird goal to have. <laughs> yeah, um, it was also originally meant to just be an, a fast HTTP, HTTP server. Mm. So yeah, yeah, it's gotten a lot bigger than that. Um, so the kind of story that led to IOJS um, was that the, the company that was maintaining it at the time um, was continuously pushing uh, 0 0.12, so node 0 0.12 out. And this had been happening for two years. Mm -hmm. um, and that meant that new JavaScript features like ES6 features weren't actually landing because a uh, upgraded version of V8 would prevent, yes. it, would, it would be like a major change even though it was like pre 1.0 it wasn't following Simver very well. Um, so, you know, it would be a major change and they just weren't making that because they were trying to make it stable for the enterprise. Um, and so 
a lot of the community members who had been contributing and who had been trying to contribute um, were actually getting shut down on a lot of their contributions because they were breaking changes or yeah. they were major. Uh, that led to a lot of frustration. And eventually that frustration led to something called Node Forward, which was a kind of underground initiative that the contributors that were not at this company, uh, tr it was their effort to try to solve a lot of the problems that Node was seeing at the time. From there, um, one specific individual, uh, Fyodor Indanti, Indutni, Never say that name right. I can never say his last name right. So on Thanksgiving Day, uh, Fyodor just said, fuck it. And um, he forked Node into IOJS. Yeah. At that point, we actually had two implementations yep. of Node. Yep. And it felt like you had to sort of commit to one. Yep. Uh, and it also, to me, felt like, in my mind, it felt like iOS... Uh, io.js was was winning. Yep. Uh, I don't know if that was the view that everyone had, but um, that, it felt like yeah, that's it's gonna be it. Yeah, and I, I think that was the view of most people. Um, I think that the ones who didn't feel like that and felt a little bit of uncertainty were the enterprises that were trying to stick with yeah. Joint and. Try not to say the name, and I did. Um, <laughs> we will edit it out. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah, um, <laughs> we won't. <laughs> everybody, everybody, will, everybody knows it anyway. Yeah, but they, you know, the ones that were trying to stick with it um, were unsure, yeah. and so they they were the ones that kind of had to be addressed in that yeah. solution, and it ended up working out. We now have the Node.js Foundation, um, and you know, a pretty solid governance model, um, a lot of work. Um, and that all came together when Node.js merged back with IOJS and that created Node 4. But how did the work to get this fork back? Like, I, like that just yeah, seem, seems insurmountable. Like, you have these, they, these, this seems like herding sheep in space to me. Yep. Like, they have, like, these are people that go off and fork Node and they get people to follow them. They seem like the kind of people that are a bit tricky to get back into yep. the fold, like, like how, how did that even, who did that even? So um, honestly, it was a lot of the people who were doing Node Forward. Um, oh. Those same contributors who were the ones who were really dedicating a lot of work to Node, and they were the ones who went and contributed a bunch to IOJS and made it kind of more forward. Um, those were the people who were having discussions with the company that owned Node.js to go and kind of merge everything back together in a way that everyone was as happy as possible with. Um, and that there wasn't this dramatic fork in the community that was splitting everyone, but more so we could have a, a unified uh, a group of people again. So why do you think they succeeded while other projects like, uh, what's the CI, Hudson and Jenkins? Do you know that Ooh, story? I don't know that story. Like it's uh, because they were they forked off, mm -hmm. um, no, no. It was a CA system called Jenkins. Mm -hmm. I think it was IBM that maintained it, and then it was forked up uh, off into a, mm -hmm. a, another open source version called Hudson. Gotcha. Uh, and I don't know exactly what happens there or why they never managed to merge them yeah. back. But uh, I don't know. Maybe somebody knows in the comments that can make, <laughs> like knows why. Uh, but I just found it fascinating that that this seemed to me like a remarkable feat to yeah. get them back on track. So. I I think one of the biggest reasons was that the intent of IOJS was never to be a fork. It was never to be separate. It was to be merged back. That was one of the original goals. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And so there was never any kind of adversarialness around, oh, we're IOJS and oh, you're Node.js. It's more, we want these things for Node and these are what's going to be useful for the project. And like, <laughs> the community often knows best when it's, a lot of people trying to say the same thing, and there's certain people that are holding back because of whatever beliefs they have. That's such a, like, I think that's also very, um, like, it's a very good example of good leadership, yeah. I think. Um, I have this quote that I pick up, picked up from, I think it's from Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, which is, um, 
be a light, not a judge, be a model, yeah. not a critic. Uh, and I try to remember that as much as possible yeah. and not try to yell at people doing things. Yeah. Instead, like, just roll up your sleeves and, and go do it. And yeah. I think that that IO Jazz, now given that I understand the, the history well, with like, this is going to be a, f a, a fork that will go back. Yeah. It's, that's a fantastic way of changing uh, the minds of uh, the leadership, I think. Yeah. And I mean, the, it's, you know, the intent was there. They had, you know, at the beginning, there was no known reciprocation. Like, I, I don't think that was wanted from the Node.js side, but it was kind of twisted. Their arm got twisted a bit into yeah. to doing it. And it, it was, I, I agree, it was very effective leadership um, on a lot of levels. But I mean, uh, they needed that wake-up call. It felt like they have gotten stuck in a situation where they didn't listen to as much uh, to their community yeah. as they needed to. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and sometimes sometimes you just get there. Like you just forget uh, that you're doing this for <laughs> that there are people using yeah. your product, and uh, you you just start listening a little to. Uh, too little yeah. and get a little bit too focused on the vision that you had from the start and not look at well what is this what is this actually now what is what are people using it for what is the what is that context yeah and honestly like node has become such a massive platform that like I at this point even hesitate hesitate to say the node uh, node the node community you have to say the node ecosystem because mm -hmm. there are so many distinct communities in Node, and there even were back then. Um, there were you know, HTTP, HTTP servers, which was the original use for it. Then there was build tooling, then CLI tooling. Like, there's so many different uses. And even now, like you have Webpack, which uses Node heavily. There's every single tool in JavaScript ends up using Node at some point in its life cycle. And you have to think about that as an ecosystem rather than a single community, because there's too many people and too many uh, passions and needs represented for it to be singular as a community. Yeah, I, can, uh, I um, have this tirade that um, I'm really interested now that WebAssembly is arriving, yep. because then we will finally know if JavaScript is actually, <laughs> actually a good language or not. Because there's so many people going, oh, no, no, no JavaScript is just popular because it's in browsers. Yep. Uh, but I, I think that it's actually a very good language in many ways. It's just, it's just something about it. You yep. just, it's very, you get things done. It doesn't get in your way. And it's as like functional programming is so many good, like nice things about it. Uh, if you like don't look at the overt warts of it. Um, so I have this, you know, the, the Atwood's law that uh, if something can be written in JavaScript, it will eventually be written in JavaScript. I have this uh, other like MPJ's law that uh, <laughs> that if uh, if something uh, can run JavaScript, it will run JavaScript. Uh, like you, you can't stuff Node on everything. Like yeah. there's so many things running JavaScript now. Like all the phones have JavaScript engines and. It's so popular in IoT devices, and it's it's just a it's just such a it's like J it's the JVM is very popular because it's such a good runtime, uh, and uh, no, JavaScript now has like these enormous amounts of different runtimes. Yep. All the APs here are running Node. <laughs> what? Yeah, all the APs like at Nordic.js. You mean like? Well, so in the event. Those are running Node. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yep. I did not know that. <laughs> What are other weird things that run Node? Um, do you know McDonald's? Yes. Uh, so all the, it, I don't know if they have them here, but the digital, like the TV menus, yeah. all are built with web components and Node in Yarn is the backend tooling. Oh, God. Um, all the APs, so the, where the point of sales, yeah. those all use Node. I actually just started a Twitter thread. Uh, every, almost everything in Adobe uses Node. Um, there's, uh, there's so many. There's. This is one that is a little freaky to me. There's um, a device for, I believe it's insulin distribution, that uses Node, and it's all the components are open source. That one is that that one went a little too far. That like, wow. yeah, yeah the, if there's a security vulnerability, we could stop someone from getting insulin. That's yes. a little little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! But they have probably evaluated it. Yep. Like it's, uh, I mean, you have to pick some technology. Yep, exactly. And like that's, 
it there are legitimate reasons why it is a good choice for that it's just like a weird thing that something i'm working on or contributing to has is in someone's physical body that's yeah. that's a weird thing to me yeah but it's also a quality i think is sometimes self-reinforcing like somebody use starts using it for something really important yeah. and then you become aware of it and yeah. it's kind of like, like it creates this like this culture like oh my god we can't fuck up culture <laughs> Which might be bad for, for uh, the flexibility and speed of our project, yep. uh, to be fair. But I think it might be very good for like, the, um, the robustness yep. of the project. Uh, yeah, and I don't think many people know about that yet. So don't, don't tell anyone that con <laughs> contributes to Node that, yeah, don't tell them that. <laughs> There's so many weird places that it's been shoved into. Like, I mean, all of the you know, Johnny Five stuff, that's yep. super cool. Um, the, and then there's a bunch of use cases like um, I was at Philly JS uh, a year ago, and one it was in a museum, yeah. and one of the presenters was from uh, a company that does display digital displays for museums. Uh -huh. So they ship all their displays are Chromium with Node, um, and so it's a very interesting thing where like there's a bunch of uh, museums in the U.S. Yeah. that if you go to them you're interacting with Node when you're interacting with the digital displays. Super cool stuff. JavaScript is everywhere. Yes. It also means that there's so many jobs, there's so many different ways that no matter what your interests are, you can apply JavaScript to them. Oh, I didn't think of that. Like, like that is one of the very cool things about being a programmer is that, especially a JavaScript programmer, now yeah. that you mention it, uh, that allows you to contribute to whatever field you like. Where can people find you online? So you can find me on Twitter um, at bitandbang, B-I-T-A-N-D-B-A-N-G. Brilliant. Awesome. Uh, anything else that you would like to add? Any uh, final words of wisdom that are important? So I'd say if you want to start contributing to Node, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help get you started. Um, or just hop into the repos and look for the uh, good first issue label. Is there a link that we can send people to uh, where like a good getting started thing? I can send that, I can give you that link. Yeah, we will put that in the episode description. No, there, there that's the camera shit. <laughs> like I'm, I'm looking at that one out of habit. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. This has been such a great uh, conversation. I've, it's, it's been such a pleasure. Yeah. That is it. You can find information about how to uh, follow Tierney and how to get involved with contributing to Node in the episode description. Another thing that you can find in the episode description is our sponsor. Launch Darkly is now integrated with Jira so that you can track your issues and your feature flags in parallel. If you use Jira or Launch Darkly, you should really check it out at launchdarkly.funfunfunction.com. You have just watched an episode of Fun Fun Function. I release these every Monday morning, 0800 GMT. But you will forget that so you can subscribe by clicking here. Or you can check out another episode right now by clicking here. I am MPJ, that's the sun. Until next Monday morning, stay curious.